Nigeria very sadly became the poverty capital of the world. And we hear those things thrown up, but they're not quite sure how they were arrived at. The Brookings Institution, um, in its uh, regular surveys, uh, found about three years ago that um, India, with 1.4 billion or so people, finally had fewer poor people than Nigeria with our 200 or so million people. That's how we became the poverty capital of the world. The single biggest collection of very poor people were in India, but now they are in Nigeria. In fact, uh, it will be likes to make the point that when you combine India's 1.4 and China's 1.4 billion people, there are more poor in Nigeria than in those countries combined. Now that's a frightening place to be as an economy. Yep. I like to sit on the left side of the aeroplane window seat, hopefully, when I'm flying to Port Harcourt. And from that, I just look at the coastline from Lagos, just look at these wide beaches and look as we're going and saying, what kind of a people can have this kind of gift and be poor. The blue economy, I mean, if you just imagine that if we just took ourselves seriously and did something about the blue economy, the resources that come from the ocean, we can have full employment in this country. We can have income per capita that will go into the 15,000s very easily, you know. But there they are resources wasted. Um, Forbes magazine published an article that hurt me very much in May, May 28, 2019, I believe it was. Um, it was called Nigeria, Africa's Money Losing Machine. You want to lose money? Go into Nigeria. Because institutions are so weak, regulatory risk so high that in the end, you're likely to lose money in Nigeria. So most investors are not coming. In a time when capital is so available in the world that I continually go back to the French economist, Thomas Fiketty, who essentially has written the book on capital in this century and capital and inequality. There's never been more capital available in the world, in the history of the human race as it is uh, today. In fact, just a couple of people, less than 20 people in California own more capital than the entire continent of Africa. And we can't dress ourselves up nice enough for that capital to flow into our country. There's so many hurting things about the economy. Uh, Prof, not, not, not to, not to uh, we, we are privileged to have uh, Professor Bongadi here, yes. uh, Professor of Economics, uh, Lagos Business School, Pan Atlantic University. You, you've had Prof um, talk about these things. Yeah, you know. Where do you think the Ubidati campaign can do things differently, considering the myriads of problems that exist? Yeah, thank you very much. I mean, let me bear off. Uh, from what Prof uh, said about uh, capital, you know, being super abundant up until very recently. And uh, with the current changes we've seen in the global economy, um, you know, brought about by the pandemic uh, 2019 through 2020, and then the world economy started to show signs of recovery by 2021, lead, uh, leading up to 2022, then Russia invaded Ukraine. So that again brought another phase of shock in the global economy. So today, uh, the world economy is uh, struggling with uh, high inflation. Um, as central banks all over the world trying to, you know, rein in this uh, rampaging inflation using very hawkish macroeconomic policy of raising interest rates. So what that means is that global interest rate has gone up very high. So capital is no longer going to be available to countries such as Nigeria. 
So uh, that means that we're going to be, um, you know, constrained to seek for capital locally, domestically, because um, internationally, uh, they will be requiring so much of us in terms of uh, interest rates. It's no longer accessible and no longer viable as an option. Um, and then it is as a result that Moody's rated us, you know, uh, recently below junk status. You know, so that means our prospects to raise money from um, outside this economy is going to be very tough. Now, what is the implication? Uh, government will have to compete with private firms for the sparsely available capital locally. And that is what economists will refer to as, uh, you know, uh, crowding out. So government, will, public sector will crowd out private sector. So what will be the implication? We're going to see large-scale insolvency of, um, you know, corporations as they will be, you know, hard-pressed to find the capital, you know, for working capital will be a serious challenge. So it will have implication for job, jobs, for economic growth, and these are all indicators that are already in, a, in Nigeria, you know, at a very high level. Um, but there is hope. Mm, that's, that's, there what, is that's hope. what we want to hear. Exactly. That's what we want to hear. So it's important to, you know, dress the background so that we now know where mm. will be that he uh, mm. comes in. Now, um, the other day I was on Arise TV, the same day I was also on CNBC Africa on similar, you know, conversation. Now, um, w the, the IMF just concluded last week their Article 4 visitation to Nigeria, which is simply, you know, um, kind of a rounding up of their member countries, studying their, uh, their macroeconomic conditions, having, um, you know, parlays with the macroeconomic managers to know the direction the economy is headed and looking at the key indicators. So that's what it concluded last week in Nigeria, and then they came up with their report, uh, which shows paint a very negative picture in the near term. But the recommendation they gave seemed to have been lifted straight from Obidati Manifesto. That is heartwarming. Uh, also, when um, AfriInvest, uh, published a kind of a summary of the same Moody's rating in terms of the way out. Again, their uh, response came like they lifted, uh, lifted it out of Obidati Manifesto. So what is it in the Obidati Manifesto to address the near-term risk? You know, so the challenge that we have today, as Prof mentioned, is that Nigeria is a country that is awash with opportunities, but we keep you know, um, wasting all the opportunities that we have. So we've not managed to build a productive economy. We've not managed to build our, our, our you know, foreign reserve and our external sector, which is the, the strength of any economy, right? In every economy, you have the consumption, you have investment, you have the government. These are all domestic. But then the external one, the one that is looking outside from where, I mean, as a family, um, the family has to sell something, you know, you sell your labor to earn income. Mm -hmm. So as an economy, which is, economy is uh, Greek for household. So as an economy, we are selling something outside and then we have to get um, income. The income we earn comes from the external sector and that is where we haven't prioritized. Now, the BDAT manifesto, you know, is focused on the external sector of the Nigerian economy. But before that could, uh, could happen, so we have to address the macroeconomic imbalances that we have. Now, what is the first one is the way the central bank has operated over the past uh, few years. Now, we've seen also, uh, Prof mentioned, uh, you know, this uh, multidimensional poverty, how we have over, overtaken uh, India as the, uh, the poorest country in the world. Or the country that has, well, that's, it's almost the same thing, the country that has the largest concentration of poor people. Um, that didn't just happen overnight. I think it's a combination of policies of government. So uh, the people didn't become poor uh, by themselves, but it's simply because policies that have uh, you know, been implementing over the years have not worked. So uh, in the last uh, uh, seven years, going to eight years now, we've seen this you know, direct targeting of poverty through different uh, schemes by the central bank and by so many, so many government agencies. We created agencies for social, whatever, you know, yet 
it has, none of those have succeeded in defending the people against poverty. So poverty has so much decimated our people, showing that we cannot continue on the same track. So what is the, uh, the, the, the response of Obidati to that? Um, one is that you know, the central bank will be made to focus on its core mandate, which is simply you know, managing the money supply, you know, uh, controlling inflation in the system. Mm -hmm. okay? So all these other interventionist policies, development, trade related, those are not the core mandates of the, of the central bank. Central banks should focus on macroeconomic policy alone. And then whereas the competent authorities will take responsibility for all this in a transparent and accountable manner. Now, the next thing that the, World ba I mean, the IMF and Moody's referred to was also the, the uh, well, like I say, the exploitation of the ways and means advances, okay, mm -hmm. which we have seen. Um, okay, in a layman's Extremely terms, abuse. simply abuse, mm -hmm. you know, printing money, reckless printing of money um, w w that turned the central bank into a piggy bank of the federal government. Mm. Uh, that shouldn't be. Uh, IMF pointed to that. In violation should, of laws. In violation of extant laws. It shouldn't mm. be more than 2% of the budget deficit, of the budget of the year. And it should be fully amortized at the end of the budget cycle. It's not something you carry over to the next year. But we've seen that it's gone to more than 28% uh, currently. And, it's keeping, and, and then there is no way we can even stop right now. In the near term, we still need to continue, but it has to stop somewhere along the line. So the IMF recommended the securitization that the CBN you know, recommended should happen as soon as possible, mm -hmm. uh, as soon as possible. But then that is even not even a solution because it carries its own drawback. When India tries something like that, it actually was in the inflation situation. So what does Obi Dati plan to do when they come in? So that is the first thing. So you know, we have to build a fiscal buffer, stop the leakages. That's the first thing that needs to happen. Then another one, which is uh, very uh, strong, which is strong uh, because it resonates with the people, has to do with the fuel subsidy. Okay, much of that printing of money has gone into uh, fuel fuel subsidy. That has to go as well. Which uh, Mr. Obi has referred to as plain stealing. That's what it is. <laughs> so we Plain cannot stealing. continue on that track. Subsidy has to go. And, uh, but it's then, important to explain this to people because it's uh, always coming up. Oh, if you remove subsidy, people will die. No. We have um, on the manifesto, if you read the manifesto carefully, um, there, are there are commitments to uh, social safety nets okay, that will be rolled out on a transparently targeted basis that will address the socially um you know uh, um you know uh, challenge, challenge in, in in the system mm -hmm. so because whenever you have this kind of uh, of problem and then you try to target the poor people there is always the danger of mistargeting mm -hmm. yeah. those who are not poor we you know lay claim to it even more benefit, because they have more. exactly mm. so we also we need to put in place you know schemes to ensure that the right people are targeted, the underprivileged. Those are the people. So the, these are clearly mapped out on the strategy uh, paper that's been developed for the OB that the, uh, administration to address the drawbacks that will come from the removal of waste subsidy. So that is one. Then another one is exchange rate. Now that is a, a, a longer term, uh, not in the near term, but in about 12 months, there is need to um, you know, harmonize the exchange rate. That is another, um, will I say, stealing going on oh, in yes. the government, you know, round tripping and all of will that. Will we ever see a Nigeria where without dual exchange rates? It where is, you don't have black market and... Uh, well, you know, the thing is that we're, unlike now, so many people, we, we agree, with, so many economists will tell you that Nigeria's economy is on a kind of an autopilot. Um, we, but that doesn't mean that we will have to run a strictly competitive market economy. That is a long-term project. It will happen. But in order to get there, there is need to direct the economy. You know? So it will be a guided policy. Yes, um, we will have a, the unification of exchange rate at some point. But then at this point in time, remember, the government has accumulated huge debt. Uh, even if we go direct and liberalize fully, which will definitely happen, we need to know that, you know, we have to have an eye on our debt burden. 
I, currently? I think, Mungo, it's important to go to the history of this. In the 1980s, it was thought that Nigeria was in a hopeless situation. The divergence between the exchange rate, the nominal exchange rate, and what is generally the purchasing power parity was so huge, it was a big laugh, it was thought not possible. How can we ever systematically work at building a foreign exchange market was developed. We went to a two-tier foreign exchange market, we kept working at this, and the market evolved. evolved. And we had exchange rates that did not diverge for a long time. And then suddenly, bad behavior crept in. In the last couple of years, we've nearly ruined that market. And that's why we are where we are. Fixing that is critical. But amongst the cri critical issues important here is the infrastructure that will facilitate production, that will enable us to go from consumption to that production for export to end the foreign exchange that will make that easy. Now, uh, Dr. Peter Agada has led a team in the big tent that has focused on infrastructure that made the input into the Ubi Dati Manifesto. And I think it's important that we give a sense for the big picture of infrastructure thrust that will help facilitate this move to production uh, and how this will contribute in many other ways. I mean, Bongo was talking really about the circular flows of income in society, um, jobs will come from all of those things. So uh, the households are contributing, all these other sectors are growing in the pri private sector. What, what is the nature of that plan? All right, thank you so much. Um, um, point number five of the seven point um, agenda of the Obidati um, presidency by the special grace of God is to build expansive world-class infrastructure for effective power supply, rail roads, air transportation, pipeline network through integrated public-private partnership, and entrepreneurship public sector governance. That's, I just took it off the document. So what we did in our team was to study this nation, 923,000 square kilometers, as a human being, like the body of a human being. And what does it take this body to, to, to live, basically, to be productive, to live, and to exist? Um, we, we see infrastructure, infrastructure development as the arteries, nerves, and the vein system that enables this body to exist, to consume, to excrete, okay, to, to, to have life built up on a daily basis, okay? Um, we have just come to a simple summary um, based on backgrounds of uh, policies that government has developed over the years. The government has developed several policies over the years. We've looked at them, we've studied the pitfalls, we've taken the best parts of uh, these policies, and we have arrived at one point. Now, for the OB Dati program, what we will immediately do is to hit the ground running with a, our tag for that program is called optimization. Haven't listened to um, um, Professor Bongos here. You, you've seen the conditions around being able to um, go for debt, being able to borrow from international and all of that. Yes, that has guided the background of what we call um, um, optimization of what is already on ground. Okay, let's keep it at op optimization, Dr. Agada. Now, it's called Optimization of Nigeria National Assets, Infrastructure Corridor and Grid Development by a Labor and Logistic Optimization System. What does this really mean? Okay, in summary, Nigeria has developed about 55,000 um, kilometers of arterial roads, several ports, power plants, um, several infrastructure for national development stationed in different parts of our country, okay? Um, between these infrastructures and road, we have vast expanse of lands, buried uh, natural resources that haven't been touched. Remember I said, 
we're treating infrastructure like the person. Yes. Just imagine your body being sick, deprived of food, minerals, but you have, what the body does, it goes into systems, autophagy for healing and several things on its own. It's programmed that way. So we think Nigeria should go into a form of autophagy, for example. What do we have in power plants? What do we have in road network? What's wrong with them? How can we get them functioning? Okay? How can we get all of these things functioning in an optimal form? What is wrong with them? Do we need to, do we need to um, um, cover the roads again with uh, another layer of asphalt? Do we need to construct new rural roads? Do we need to um, um, go produce, do we need to go off grids for power in certain areas of the country? All of that has been analyzed in detail, okay? So what we've done is that we have now come up with a solution um, in a nutshell that we call um, C2P packs in different parts of the country, Construct, co consumption to production packs okay. located in different parts of the country. Um, um, and these uh, packs are endowment based. For example, the, the, the construction to production packs is Amfara State, for example, is solid mineral driven. Okay? Good. It's a one stop location where industry, housing, infrastructure, logistics, and all of this happen together to make that one location a life of its own. Give it a life of its own. And that place is located close to an existing national grid. Mm. You don't have to go construct a new road. A road passes there. The railway already passes there. So we put it there so that production happens there and immediately gets into the system and moves out for export. The one in Benue, for example, is agro-industrial driven. Okay? Now, in my personal experience uh, in housing development in this country, housing has been a big challenge for several reasons. But one of the biggest reasons in housing development, I've, gone to, I've, I've had national awards on housing, okay, during the times of uh, Mrs. Sama Pepo. One big problem, even people with regular paying jobs, civil servants, could not afford, after having gone through the analysis yeah. of what it takes to pay back for housing, even government officials that were given to us then, with their salaries confirmed. They gave us 100 people, for example, only 16 qualified wow. for housing. Now, what we're doing with the C2P parks is that we will tie production, job employment to your housing at the same location. Just imagine one big place where you have industries, you have housing, you have production, you have logistics, and then somewhere around there you have nice, affordable housing for creating new cities. Creating That's new right. cities, basically. Yes. Creating new cities. It's creating a new economy, creating a new, new city yes. system. And we have made sure of this, that these C2P parks are located at least 15 to 20 kilometers from existing city center deliberately. So that the new Nigeria itself can come from that. It can expand and expand and expand. Before it merges with the existing city, we have moved to the next dimension of the Industrial Revolution. And by so doing, yeah. even create the congestion of those cities. Exactly. Yeah. In addition, it also has what economists refer to as agglomeration effect. Yes. Uh, so you are bringing in the, in the productive capabilities of different industries together. Mm -hmm. So, which is, uh, you know, they say that uh, a whole that is larger than, you know, the sum of its parts. Exactly. Synergy. Synergy. Yeah, because, yeah, you know, it, it makes no sense sometimes when, you know, I discuss with friends from who are in, in the importation business and they tell you, you know, they bring Lagos. their goods through Lagos. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yet some of them operate close to the Niger Delta area where you, already, where you have a, already existing it seaport. Seems, seems. And people begin to wonder, what is wrong with our country? Why do we have, we, are, we have long coastal line and exactly. sea and everything is congested. It's a failure of trade policy yeah. through the years yeah. that has made everything come to Lagos. Now it's a burden on Lagos. I look at our papa, how the, it is a nightmare. But if we had had development that was sensitive to this, all of the production facilities around the Midwest parts of the country are serviced from Bori, Newport's coming up in Akwai Bomb, Port Harcourt is there, all of the service. But somehow, poor trade policy allowed everything to be focused on Lagos. Now this is a burden on Lagos, and it has prevented the development of oh, those parts yeah. of the country. So you've got to have spatial exactly. development exactly. that keys into Absolutely. infrastructure, it's almost like the way Lagos itself developed creates dormitory towns. Every morning, everybody wakes up and starts heading into Lagos Island. It's a nightmare. 
we ought to be able to have places of work close to places of, of residence. Yeah. In. So you can live around Festac and never, unless you want to come and watch a show at TBS, never you can spend 10 years and not get to Lagos Island. Yeah. And you have a complete life. But that needs to be re So that means there's so much talked about Lagos blueprint is not really a blueprint. Because, I mean, if I'm in the entertainment business, for instance, and I understand what you're saying, if there was an intentional, very good blueprint, the entertainment industry in Lagos would have exploded. Because the reason no artist in Lagos with a population of almost 20 something million people can do a concert and have up to 6,000 people in attendance is because the, 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 the venue is in, on the island. Yes. The population is on the mainland. Yes. And in between the island and the mainland is gridlock that you can navigate. Then when you come for a concert, you can't go home. I, you know, so... You raise a very, very important point in all this conversation about the economy. Nigeria does not have a 24-hour economy. No. At 7 o'clock, everybody is rushing yeah. to get home. And yeah. most economies that thrive... In rotation. Yeah. The people who work from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. Yep. The people who work from... Shoot. Entertainment is going on all the time at yes. night. People are... Yes. Yes. Look, I, I once stayed in downtown New York, in uh, Hilton, and I came out at 2 a.m. I'm, I'm not kidding. Yes, sir. And I thought I was yes. at noon. Yes. Human beings were pushing each other like yes. sardine at 2 a.m. And this was not a Saturday night. So we need to create a night economy in this country. Yeah. It would do so much for employment, for all kinds of things. And these special developments have direct bearing to it. And, and you know, in, in agreement with what you just said, because even a 24-hour economy, as practiced in other parts of the world, is what gives rise to youth labor. Because what it means is that uh, undergrads in the university can go to Work their lectures night. in the daytime Absolutely. and still have vac jobs in yes, the evening. Exactly. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean... Our children, those of us who have kids abroad who go to school and combine it with, you know, little, little jobs here, that is what they depend on mm -hmm. to make extra money that sustains them. Yep. You know, so, I mean, uh, Bongo, you, you want to come in a little bit? Yeah, so, you know, this is just a matter of incentive. Um, like when you, when Prof mentioned, uh, you know, having people move um, to maybe, you know, you raise the issue of uh, your friends who do business in the Niger Delta and they still have to wait for their containers to arrive from Lagos and all of that. And then meanwhile, there are ports there. That, so it's just a matter of incentive. Okay. So we can use tax policies to decongest, you know, uh, 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 Lagos and all these congested cities. And then we don't even have too many cities in Nigeria, so to speak. I mean, that fit the bill of cities. Mm -hmm. I mean, in Lagos, uh, if you've been following the indicators, Lagos appears as one of the most unlivable uh, cities, in the, cities in the world. Okay, so policies, you know, we need incentive. We need uh, tax policy, for instance, to, to incentivize uh, um, activities in other sectors. But again, it's one thing to say um, tax policy, incentives, it requires political will. Mm -hmm. It's just about political will. And then that is why I think Ubidati is different from the other competitors, from the other candidates. So when you see him talk, you could see someone who is deliberate, who is intentional. So, and again, economic policy that works is not a fit and start thing. Mm -hmm. It's something that you start, you see it through, mm -hmm. follow it through. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, so there is always that feedback loop. In the system that is not what that is exactly what we do not have in nigeria prof mentioned something earlier uh when i was uh, listening outside he was talking about uh, salai martin and subramanian and mm. all of that there is this other economic uh, thinker uh, uh rosenstein rodan mm. you know the big push policy you know the the man who proposed the big push now in an economy um you you, you know we need to understand what we have um, latent comparative advantages. And then we have so much of this. And we don't need to activate all our latent comparative advantages. One is even enough. Mm. So let's look for those ones that have, or, or we've identified them, okay, that have m huge multiplier impacts. Mm -hmm. So once you do that, then you now have, because it, it connects to what Dr. Yes. Uh, mentioned, you know, once you activate it, 
now it begins to have yes. the you know that effect of multiply yes. yeah. impact on other sectors and pull everything together you're going to have Let jobs to you're going to have industrialization so you don't even need to you know to um mm. begin to uh, uh, give companies money yes. uh That's corporate like money and all yes. of that these things will happen mm. by mm. themselves mm. automatically yeah, you, you, you want to yes. add something in, to it anchoring, yeah. in anchoring yeah. to that yes. yes you see as it were we've already found the locations where these c2p parks will be Mm. Even right now, Good. okay. Um, based, like I said, based on endowments, endowments. Uh, mm. and located on very, very important existing trunk infrastructure that will be optimized. You mm. know, we we'll just fix them and mm. all of that and get them functioning again. Now, um, we have already planned what will happen there. So as soon as he hits the office, we are hitting the ground running with immediate site and services for these places. Okay, you know when you produce sites and services in a raw piece of land, you've taken the value of that land up immediately. immediately. So that immediately that is From done, investment, areas. you know, we've already taken that as a, pay, a document, a CEO with investment, title with investment, and then before you know what's happening, we're already building the power plant, the off-grids, the logistic plan, the water system, okay? Mm. And then before you know what's happening, once you put infrastructure on a piece of land, everybody wants to come there and be part of what that future will be like. So it's a, it's a system that once you touch with that site and services, it's packs. It's auto, a pack. Auto catalyzed. It's yeah. a pack. And, and you know, talking yeah. about this and the, the example that I was giving about flying to Port Harcourt every time I'm feeling so pained. You know, uh, Paul Collier, Professor Collier at Oxford, is one of the leading authorities in this whole new area of ocean facing cities. He gave the CBN an annual lecture here in Lagos in 2017, and the then governor of Lagos, Ambode, uh, was listening to him and was so uh, excited by the things he was talking about, ocean facing cities, that he invited him back to give the 50th anniversary lecture for Lagos State that same year, May of uh, 19, 2017. One of the things that Collier says, which you know, I keep thinking about, the possibilities of ocean facing cities when you look at that long coastline mm. we just go down a little to undo yes undo has the longest coastline in yes. our country yes you build one port in undo create one new city there yes. you know you are amazed at what we fail to see in our country and we allow poverty but because of lack of prof that's exactly the south korean model if you go to self, uh, Seoul, for instance, you will see Hyundai, mm -hmm. LG, mm -hmm. all the big uh, South Korean conglomerates. Mm -hmm. They are all lined up on the coast. On the coast. Yeah. All of them. Okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, you know the interesting thing about South Korea? They don't, do not have independent custom that is somewhere. Mm -hmm. Okay? The customs are nested within this the the complex. Yes. Sure. The infrastructure. Right? So when Hyundai, for instance, produces, they do not have to wait to ferry their products to, to the port, oh, another port. No, it's from right there. From there, it's right there. Yes, yes. Okay. right there. So uh, we had uh, the World Bank presented their stuff the other day, uh, the book or uh, uh, reports they, they recently uh, completed at LBS. And then there was this converse, conversation, and then talking about Indonesia. Okay, when Indonesia, Indonesia has all the features like Nigeria today. But in just 10 years, in a decade, Indonesia has, you know, transformed their destiny has become a sustainable middle-class, middle-income economy. This happened in 10 years. Mm. 10 years ago, we actually had better statistics than Indonesia. I'm just talking about 10 years ago. That's 2013, 2012. But within that period, now, don't forget about Indonesia. When you talk about, um, uh, whatever, uh, crony capitalism, yes. Indonesia is a poster, ca uh, poster child for crony yeah. capitalism. Suka so Suhato. Sukano, Suhato. Mm -hmm. Now, when they decided to transform the economy, what did they? They, they now started to drive market-driven competitive policies mm -hmm. in the system. Mm -hmm. Just something similar to what you're talking about. Thank you. Now, the another thing they did okay. was to liberalize mm -hmm. the customs. Customs. Now, they, it was privatized. You know, mm -hmm. and once that happened, the Indonesian economy. You know, even took before all of this happened. Yeah. Peter Lewis, at size, a friend of mine, wrote the book titled Growing Apart. It was a comparison of Nigeria and Indonesia. Forty years ago, people used to say to Indonesia, 
won't you just be like Nigeria? Yes. <laughs> Today they say to Nigeria, can't you be like Indonesia? Yes, yes. <laughs> In closing, uh, yes. Doctor, is there anything you want to I add? I want to just add that this C to P parks will be built on innovation will be at the center of it. Innovation hubs. It's yes. a scene of the youths of tomorrow. And then around concentric rings around innovation will be this development. And then at the back of it will be the ability to export right. from the spot there. You don't have to ferry your goods to Lagos or to Potakot. Right there, there's a logistic system that puts you international, okay? Right on the spot, you sell your goods on all international markets. Fantastic. And location has been picked. As soon as Mr. Peter will be gets into office, site good and to, services good to go. in the road. Thank you very Thank much. You. you want closing yeah, so, you two see, seconds? That's the export-driven economy. Yeah. That is it. There is no economy today that growing in the world, China, Singapore, India, right? Either they're exporting services or they're exporting goods and uh, good, goods. So, or combination thereof. Basically, you must, must be so selling moving, something. Moving from consumption to export-driven production. production. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Professor Bungo Adi. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Peter Gada. Um, of course, uh, Professor Pat, you're still here with me. You're not going anywhere. <laughs> you're not going anywhere. All right. Uh, and that's an economy. Is it not exciting to hear the team that put together, you know, parts of the manifesto here, you know, hearing from them, knowing what is to come? I'm, I'm getting excited already because we know how many million youths are out of job. And with the ideas that I'm hearing is music to my ear. All right. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for contributing. Don't go anywhere. We'll take a break. And when we come back, we'll come back with something different.